Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 104, with me, your host, Agostino. <coughs> this podcast, sorry about the cough, is brought to you by Audible. To claim one free book credit, as well as a 30-day free trial, click the link in the description below to get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. Audible is one of the best platforms for audiobooks, it has over 400,000 titles from some of your favorite authors. And what makes it even better is that some of the books are narrated by the author themselves, so it really brings the books to life. So if you're on the fence about reading or you want to get started and you know, you're know you looking at your list of goals that you had for January and you haven't got the reading list done yet, but you want to get it done, Audible is the best way to kind of jump the queue and get your reading book habit kick started so click the link below to come in one free book credit as well as a 30-day free trial from audible.com for us aggie the link is audible.com for us as a double g g y that's audible.com for us as a double g y to claim one free book as well as a 30-day free trial <laughs> on with the show so we're back again episode number 104 thanks for tuning in i'm back feeling nice and fresh today i did not work out i'm trying to space him out i'm trying to do four days a week so monday west tuesday rest wednesday thursday rest friday um and then saturday rest sunday that's the plan right that's the plan hopefully i'll do it this week it's the first week back after tonsillitis so i'm trying to slowly but surely ease my way back into it but i'm feeling kind of fresh i'm feeling kind of good i've got that weird sort of like weight loss what happens uh, post illness so i'm feeling i'm looking a little bit more skinny than what i should do i'm sure um throughout the week my let my weight will kind of level out as i kind of get back to eating normally i get back to like sitting down i get back to being sed- sedentary or whatever it may be called but the one thing that is helping me um to keep to maintain my savelle figure is that i'm now taking a bus to work and i forgot how great it was to take the bus to work um i started taking the bus to work primarily to save money before i go off to berlin i'm trying to scrape as much pennies as i can before i head off and spend all my money on drugs and alcohol <laughs> um so i'm trying to do that but i forgot how nice it is to um how great it was to be on a bus number one you get loads of shit done right because the bus train is a bit longer than a train so i can i can edit a podcast i can start reading and shit and generally just a, a better experience um than going in a train and or being underground or being overground it just feels a little bit meh you feel like you kind of whenever i get on a train you always feel like you're kind of on the train and you get spat back out again do you know what i mean you gotta kind of go on to your journey so, and I also feel like I'm maybe using my time a bit more efficiently now because I woke up a little bit earlier. I'm now recording this podcast early than I would do in the morning. So I have enough time in order for me to walk to the station, get a bus and then walk to work. So it's, it's a pretty good um, medium ground I'm in now. I think even when I come back from Berlin, I might continue doing the same thing. Or the other option is to go and maybe get a bike. Um, I've been looking at a few bikes to get. I, I did have some dreams of having an e-bike. You know those electric bikes everyone's riding? Those YouTubers have those... Um, super 73s they're kind of like uh they look like a beach they sort of look like a beach buggy sort of bike right that everyone's sort of riding at the moment but they are grands like absolute grands i think i'll try and get up now on the screen so you guys can see it but they are absolute grands right so i was thinking about getting one of those but obviously like it probably far exceeds my budget at the moment so i might just just go get a bike and just kind of like use that for the time being but i'll put up on the screen now you guys can see it but these are the bikes that everyone's kind of getting all the youtubers have them um, they're quite popular. They're basically electric bikes that sort of look like a dune buggy. Um, and they, they they look pretty fun, you know, really um, aggressive tires. So you can use them in the urban environment. Loads of room at the back to kind of strap on a bike and shit. And they look fairly cool, but they're about three grand, four grand or some shit like that. So that probably isn't the best option. I think that's one of the YouTube guys riding one now there on the picture above. So I'm not going to get a Super 73. So instead, I'm just going to get a regular push bike for the time being just to kind of, you know, get myself back on the whole bike train but i just hate having to take a te- change of clothes man i've got showers at work but having to take a change of clothes and all that shit's just annoying i guess anywhere i could cheat is maybe just take a change of underwear and undershirt right so then i had to just change that when i get in there and kind of have like a bit of a bit of a cleanup but yeah i'm not really a fan of all that stuff but i might have to get back into it but i, I do remember when i used him it's weird though because i've gone for two extremes i've gone for non riding a bike to riding a bike 13 miles back and forth from work i used to do a half marathon a day or a marathon a day, basically. Um, no, half marathon a day. Um, seven miles each way, going from um, my house in Stratford way to Shepherd's Bush. Uh, when I used to work in, um, obviously, in West London. And now I've gone to the complete opposite. I just don't take any, I don't ride a bike at all. I, I can't remember the last time I had a bike. But that's primarily because we had a, we've got a bike lock storage unit thing at the bottom of my flat. And um, there was, I think there were too many 
leftover brick and brack bikes that are taking up room. So the building decided to kind of get rid of them. They put a notice all over the flat saying, oh, you have to call this number before this certain date to get your bike or it's going to get thrown into the scrap heap. And of course, I waited until the last minute. By the time I went down, all the bikes were already taken. So I lost my bike because I was just lazy to go and call the people or put like a little mark on it. But, you know, say la vie. But apart from that, um, everything else has been pretty good. I felt pretty nice, actually. I'm kind of getting to the end of the antibiotic stage. It's the last day of antibiotics. So I'm really, really happy about that. Woohoo. Gonna have an uh, anti antibiotic party. And yeah, I feel, I, feel, I feel quite good. I feel quite decent. Um, I feel raring and ready to go. Anyway. Let's crack into the topics because, you know, cracking into the topics is always the most funniest thing. You get to talk about more things and talking about how my day is going. So anyway, episode 104, let's get into it. Number one, um, before we start off and go into anything else fun and interesting, I want to just, you know, acknowledge uh, Mac Miller's passing. So RIP Mac Miller, um, as I'm sure everyone is well aware, um, he passed over the weekend from an apparent drug overdose. Um, but the details are still to, to be confirmed. Um, it's a sad occasion for everyone involved, I think, for fans, for people that were casual observers and kind of just liked his personality anyway, uh, for people that were following his drama in relationships um, lately in the past few years, and for people that were eagerly anticipating his tour that was up and coming that looked incredible, um, for people that just got put onto him when he did the NPR tiny desk, everyone, it's a really, really sad occasion for everyone involved them. Um, it's sad to see such a young, um, promising talent such as Mac Miller, uh, life get taken away just through negligence, um, for the most part. Do you know what I mean? Um, you don't, you're not that annoyed if it's like a freak accident or some shit, but if it's just through pure negligence and overindulgence, it's always a little bit concerning. But I guess if you chip away at the story a little bit, there is obvious pain and tor torture and torment going on in his life that led him to this extent and it's just sad to see somebody at that age go through that much level of pain and having to kind of self-medicate themselves or maybe on the other end maybe it's not maybe they just enjoy recreational drugs and they just got a bit over the top this time right because there is a there is it does feel sometimes that there is a reaction when celebrities have overdoses or drug related deaths that you know they should be talking to somebody or oh, there's an outpouring of emotion. People want to talk to their friends and make sure people are not going over the edge. But sometimes um, we don't know the ins and outs of anyone's life, right? So people are maybe reading into things and thinking that Mac Miller was depressed because Ariana Grande broke up with him. But we don't know if it was like, you know, if he was over it anyway. If he had moved on, if he had another girlfriend, if he wasn't even thinking about her and if he just, you know, liked doing drugs and did too much and then he died. <coughs> That's a possibility too. So I, again... I'm not sure where I stand on it. Um, I think it is a bit weird. It is something that needs to be um, analyzed and looked at. You know, all these young musicians, especially within hip hop, who are unfortunately passing or are getting pulled in by the grips of prescription drugs. There is a problem there happening. Um, I do have a little bit of disdain for some of the bigger artists who are promoting drug use who obviously don't take drugs. I've got this theory that I've held for a long time that a lot of those guys like you know the f futures and the weekends and stuff who promote a lot of drug use don't do as many drugs as people think they do I think they just like the allure of saying they do drugs or they are talking about a life that they led before they became this global superstar I just don't think you can be future and make DS2 and do as many drugs as he says he does I don't think it's possible um, I know uh, um, having done drugs in the past or having friends who have uh, succumbed to too much drug use I know what that looks like and I know that's not possible to do it at that level with, with that amount of resources, with that amount of free time and still be uh, f a, a high caliber artist. I don't think it's something that's manageable, um, but maybe it is again, because it's something that's always been mulling in my head because I'm sure there's people out there who exist, who have a nine to five, have a family, have a business, uh, do a very high powered job, um, are responsible for a lot of people who do drugs on a daily basis and are able to function in society. They do exist. And I'm sure, and I have another theory that they're probably the majority of people, right? I think the majority of people are able to sustain uh, consistent drug use without it being a problem and it, without affecting their family or without affecting their workplace, more so than the ones who kind of um, get, um, get a bit, you know, off track and kind of lose everything. I think so for the most part. I think they do exist. The same way how, you know, I have over the years become a little bit more tolerant to alcohol, but a few years ago or a couple of years ago, you know, more if, if i drank too much it would lead me to make really really bad decisions um it would allow me to put myself in positions that would jeopardize my career would jeopardize my friendships but now over time through drinking again and for drinking uh, numerous times and kind of um 
getting my tolerance level lower well higher and higher and higher i've now seen a big difference in the amounts i can drink and the amounts i'm able to function so i'm sure if you extrapolate that and take that into drugs i'm pretty sure people can do the same sort of thing now whether or not it's healthy whether or not it's something they should be doing you know i think we could all agree it's not something that everyone should be doing in that to that level of extent but I don't know, man. I'm just, I just don't know what to make of it. Oh, I just don't know what to make of it. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if this is a, if this is a consequence of social media that's flattening, you know, the playground. So everyone's seeing everyone. So if you're Mac Miller and even though you're super successful and you have your own little dedicated lane with your own hardcore fans, you have 1,000 true fans will buy your albums again and again every single year. So you don't have to work another day in your life. I still think there is a little bit of that that exists even if you're an outside Mac Miller where you're always look kinda of looking over your you're kinda of always looking over your garden fence and checking over the other the neighbor's garden, Jeremy, you know I and seeing oh the grass is always green on the other side. I think so. It does must exist. Um I don't know if it's a consequence of that. I don't know if it's a consequence again of just having the resources and just overindulging yourself, you know, doing reliance of coke at ten in the morning because you just you can, you don't have to work anywhere, you don't have any responsibilities, you have no kids and whatever. I don't know if it's a fact of being led astray by friends. I don't know if it's a fact of, you know, you're suffering a lot inside, so you just want to self-medicate. Because I know I've had weird periods, like randomly, where I've just gone got blackout drunk for no reason, right? No reason, just got blackout drunk. Um, and I don't know whether or not that was a again, because I I bottle I bottle a lot of stuff up. Like I'm fairly even killed, but I'm also aware that there's a, you know, there's a tsunami, there's a tornado, there's a typhoon happening within inside of me, right? I know that that's happening all the time, consistent whenever I'm pushing stuff to one side there is something happening on the inside and i don't know whether or not that acting out um that overindulgence of alcohol is like my response to it outwardly maybe i don't know so i guess it goes without saying you know whoever does whoever is out there who's suffering and who has a little bit of inner turmoil going on in there who's self questioning themselves i think the best possible thing you can do apart from going to speak to people which you probably won't do because you know you're suffering alone is to turn off social media man Turn off the internet and step away, go for a walk, go for a run and kind of interact with the real world, like get tactile again. And then you'll it'll kind of put stuff into perspective. I've seen it myself anyway. That's what's helped me a lot. Um, I don't necessarily suffer from any sort of um, mental issues or go through bouts of uh, low self-esteem or anything of that malarkey. I don't really have that in me. But if I am feeling a bit bummed out about something or, you know, whatever, I have I've, I do notice that whenever I just unplug, it just sorts the situation out completely, and I'm not I'm no I know that's not rare I know that's not something that's rare to anybody else I know that kind of like over stimulation on the internet sometimes can lead your brain to making up conclusions of things that don't actually aren't actually happening or don't actually make any sense I'm sure that happens a lot more regularly than not um, so yeah sad to see him pass R I P um, to all Mike Miller fans R I P to all. Uh, I guess um, take care of yourself, all Mike Miller fans, and I guess remember him for his music, innit? Um, their last album that came out was amazing. That performance of 2009 on NPR is something to be heralded and held up there with um, Amy Wana, Amy Wana's last performance where she was performing in a church in Ireland. I forgot this. Amy Wana's performance, she was performing a cappella in a church somewhere. It's an amazing performance. Um, I think that NPR performance with Mike Miller would be looked back on time as you know one of the greats. So yeah, um, RIP Mike Miller, man gone but not forgotten um next on the topic to kind of get bring things back around to what i was talking about alcohol uh drinkers like me by adrian charles so i watched this documentary the other day um yesterday uh, night actually called drinkers like me uh with adrian charles adrian charles um, if you're familiar with him was the ex-presenter of match of the day or match of day two i'm sure one of them anyway um very, it's kind of a permanent fixture on the bbc you kind of see him all the time he's got the kind of like scrunched up like you know uh, annoyed face he, uh, he supports west brom probably one of the only kind of like pundits on tv that actually puts that supports a club that isn't you know well known or whatever um so he made this a brilliant documentary right um analyzing kind of like delving deep into the british psyche when it comes to alcohol and there's a lot of interesting conclusions in the in the uh, in the in the show that i'm sure a lot of us has kind of spoken about over a beer or in a house party sometime so basically the whole story of the documentary uh, centers around Adrian Towles um, realizing that he is drinking, I don't know, 10 times over the legal limit, over the recommended limit of drinking, right? So, you know, the kind of like units, measurements and shit that they do, right? I don't really, I don't really calculate by that way, but because I usually just abstain for days upon, days on end. But, you know, for those people that do drink or who drive and stuff, I, I think those kind of units are quite handy to kind of realize where you are. 
so he kind of um went in went on a journey talking to various people along the journey about um drinking and uh it's a societal kind of grip with some people and it's something i've thought about a lot because i generally finish work quite late when i come out i finish like 8 30 right so when i come out of work i'm seeing the real people the real ogs who are out drinking because you know six seven is like you know the casual people drinking after work having, having a, grabbing a quick pint or maybe catching up with somebody who works around the corner who's work at another company you know it's loose but if you've seen the people in the pubs at 8 30 on a monday or on a tuesday you know those are the real ogs so i've long question i've long kind of um contemplated yeah, or kind of just thought about it thinking like i wonder what that lifestyle must be like right because i guess i have an advantage or i have a slight blessing that i grew up in a fairly christian household for the most part of my life right from like zero to 21 right i grew up in a christian household so i only had my first drink maybe when i was like 19 i'd say 19 20 i had my first drink so by that time i developed a habit of not drinking right so um when i did start drinking i will it was easy for me to kind of like um, not drink at home because I lived at home with a Christian parents, conservative parents who would never accept me having alcohol in the house. Number two, because I just didn't have a, I didn't have a background of drinking. It was easy for me to kind of like go without drinking for days on end and not feel <clears throat> that um and not feel um not feel kind of itchy, not get the kind of the you know the the drinking itch that I need to kind of you know um serve it in any sort of way. So I'm lucky in that respect, but I was always kind of interested in the idea that these people would be, uh, you know, drinking every single day of, out, after work, like that constant need to have alcohol. And most of it isn't the fact that they want to have alcohol. It's more so the fact that you want to talk to a friend after work. Where do you go? Right. You've only got two options. You go to a cafe, right? Um, a, a big chain cafe, because those ones are going to be open at that time, um, like a Starbucks, a Pret and Eat or whatever it may be called. Or you go to like a, a kind of like, quote unquote, boutique um cafe shop like um what's the one that does the nitro coffees anyway you know the few of those kind of shops there's few there's only a few options you go to if you go to a cafe you go to a pub so when you go to a pub or a bar you can't exactly sit there and drink juices right you have to just drink an alcohol you have to right because the surroundings kind of like um call for it so by the time you know by the time you realize it you're already like three pints in and it's only 7 p.m so i kind of always kind of had sympathy for that idea but also had like an uh, thinking like doesn't it get a little bit tiring drinking so much alcohol every week? And doesn't don't you lose the the satisfaction, the taste, the niceness of having a drink when you're just always drinking it? I never really got it. I never really understood it. But having watched the documentary, um, it kind of makes a lot of sense that most of the drinking is to do with the hanging out part of it. It's to do with the society side of it. Most of the people that were interviewed in this Agent Charles documentary said that they felt as if like if they didn't drink, they wouldn't be fun to hang around with, which is quite sad to hear like adults say this. Not like young kids grown adults saying they don't think there'll be as much fun like most of their funnest moments most of their uh, most giggliest nights have been like after a few pints or someone's fallen off a chair or someone's rambled on about a topic that no one has any clue what they're talking about those are usually the funnest times i know for me i you know having hanged out with my friends some of the best times have been when we kind of were high or drinking you know those were kind of the funnest times You're just rambling about life and loving each other and shit they're always kind of good occasions but it, the consistent drinking, the consistent daily drug use, I just don't think is sustainable. I don't think it's something everyone needs to do. But again, I don't. I just, I just don't know if you're if the people like how, who do that are able to kind of pull back. I don't think there's a middle ground. I don't think they exist. I think, or maybe there is a middle. Maybe maybe people like me do it. Maybe more people like me do exist. Maybe there's like everyday drinkers, people like me who drink on your on the weekends, right? And then people that don't drink. That's the three levels that exist, right? But it's very hard to go from like people that drink every day to go to the middle to do like me and drink only on the weekends but i think it's easier for me to go to abstaining it's quite simple to do that because i've realized over time especially after going to a few parties sober or being sober for like a month and being in berlin when i did the um sober january um i've realized that i can't well i've not realized i've knew for a while but i know that within that environment like the berlin environment which is kind of extra charged like people are fully fully on it really raring to go that I can be sober and still have a good time. So it's not necessarily a drug thing, not necessarily a drinking thing. Um, it's more so, do I want to be in a bar or a club if I'm sober anyway? And probably not. I'd prefer not to be. But if I have to be there to catch up with a friend because that's the only place they're going to be at, then I don't mind. I'm not going to be the person that's going to um, curtail all the plans and force everyone to go to a restaurant when no one wants to eat. Right? If, you're, if, I'm, if I wants to go to a bar or a club, I'll come along, no problem. But I'm not going to stay until four. 
So the documentary was quite sober in that respect. Um, Agent Charles, towards the end, kind of figures out that you know, although he's he, although he might have a drinking problem, to completely cut a drink completely might might not be a good option for him. So he decides to kind of like cut um kind of cut down a lot. And then I think when by the time he has his last pint at the end of the show, spoiler alert, um, I think he's down to drinking one one drink a week or something like that, or don't know, first drink in a week. So he's kind of where I am, where he only kind of drinks on the weekends. And I have a, honestly, I think it's a lot more satisfying. I don't know for any anyone else, but I think. Maybe for those people that look forward to the weekend, I think maybe it's tied into that. The people that kind of don't like what they do and they're always looking forward to Saturday, maybe they're kind of constantly drinking, kind of maybe numbs you to the dullness of your job, right? So then by the time Wednesday or Thursday comes along, it kind of you can kind of get another second win and you can feel like you kind of can go and conquer the world or conquer the weekend. But I think for me, because I'm so at ease with working and I don't, um, I've not tied, I've not, I've not, I've not kind of linked having a job with my identity. I have a lot of things going on on the outside that allow me to carve my own identity, allow me to do, allow me to express myself creatively and to kind of keep my brain occupied. I don't necessarily feel the need to numb myself through, you know, during a week. Now, I'm not saying everyone is numbing themselves when they're drinking alcohol, but personally for me, I don't feel the numb myself. I know when I have had jobs that have been really shit, I have been a bit more off the rails outside of work. I, I've, I think there's no coincidence about that. Anytime I've, anytime I've been more, proactive outside of work whether it's working now or doing extracurricular activities such as recording this podcast i feel a lot more fulfilled so i don't need to drink as much or do as much need drugs but then when i'm not doing those kind of things i have to replace them with those drinks and drugs so maybe those people in the documentary are the same sort of vein they're in that kind of low period where you're com- a lot of the people agent charles are interviewing were sort of like similar age to him middle-aged people you know uh, 35 and upwards, you know, in that kind of weird low stage where you've got a job that you like, but you just keep it just to keep the lights on. Um, and that's basically it. Um, you can't bother to keep moving around. So you're going to keep the job and then you're going to just like numb the, and you know what you're doing. You're fairly co- competent at your job anyway. It doesn't require all your mental capabilities. So you can kind of ring it in and sort of like do it kind of hungover and drunk. But for me personally, knowing how I am when I drink, knowing how I am when I go out, I couldn't sustain having a career. I couldn't sustain trying to carve my own entrepreneurial journey or trying to create my own business on the side. I couldn't do it um, always with that kind of like fog of alcohol. Personally, for me, I just couldn't do it. I don't think it's it's something that I could do in the long term. Um, but again, the documentary was very, very illuminating. I highly recommend you check it out. I'm going to link it in the show notes below. Adrian Charles, um, uh, Drinkers Like Me. I think it was, it's on the BBC, but it's on YouTube too. A small link of it so you can check it out. Really, really, a really incredible documentary. And I credit to Adrian Charles for being so vulnerable. Again, putting his, putting himself out there. Because I know as guys, or as, or as drinkers anyway, as people that like to have a good time, you do tend to give, you tend to, you tend to lie to yourself, right? And tell yourself these um f- these stories um that don't actually add up right that you don't drink that much they only go out on the weekends i only do drugs at 7 p.m you do you tell yourself these weird tales i don't necessarily um kid anyone else but yourself right Adrian charles was in re- really really upfront. he really kind of like laid it out there and, and said the truth really um and kind of put himself out there for the benefit of the viewers um, and it's a really incredible documentary. Um, I hope he ends up doing a lot more documentaries. Maybe not on the sort of drinking overall, um, uh, but I think, yeah, I think he's a really good documentarian or presenter of that kind of format. He did it really, really well, and I highly recommend you check that out. Um, next on the docket, Spotify support indie artists by licensing their music. Woo hoo! So I think I mentioned this previously before in another episode, but I had this idea, right? Um, because I was talking to, or I was looking at, um, this company online right um who were kind of like you know helping people to buy back their data and exchange it in re- in, in in exchange it for um reward points and stuff right i was looking at that sort of privacy stuff and just kind of went into a bit of an insert rabbit hole then the lights kind of the the lights kind of clicked or and then or the light switched on or whatever and i made some connections in my head and i figured out that you know kind of the record industry is so broken right with the 360 deals that you know um enable um, some record labels to take a cut of everything the artist does from merch to ticket sales to tour to um, bar and nightclub appearances that's what 360 deal does right because they saw that they weren't getting that much money from streaming so they decided to implement another contract that allowed them to get more money out of the artist now on the artist side of it they would argue that they get more money up front of course but they having to give more in the long run so you might get more of um uh you might get more of a signing on bonus, whatever it might be called, right? But then you still have to give the record company more of a cut of what you produce. 
So I thought, um, especially nowadays with um, a lot of the artists coming from, you know, uh, platforms like Mixcloud or Soundcloud and stuff or Bandcamp, some of the independent artists, it would be great if some of those guys and some of the bigger guys especially could then license their music to different D DSPs, digital streaming platforms, and then license their product to those platforms, maybe for exclusive rights for a certain period of time, maybe have it, you know how Drake does, or Beyonce knows people have like, um, they'll release their album exclusively on title, title for like a couple of weeks, then it'll go into other streaming platforms. I thought it wouldn't be amazing if you could license your album to a streaming platform instead of signing to a record label. Because you, nowadays you don't need record labels anyway. No one really is buying physical albums for the most part. Um, there are a small minority of people who are still buying physical albums, mostly people that drive cars and shit. Maybe it's not minority. Maybe there is a group of people out there. But for the most part, everything's kind of steering its way towards a digital revolution. right? Everything's kind of online. Everything is about streaming. Everything's about playlists. So why not just cater to that industry and license your music to Spotify or Apple Music or Tidal and then uh, receive um, a signing on bonus or some sort of percentage cut from the streams and also get given um, maybe preferential treatment when it comes to getting your stuff on playlists, when it comes to maybe um, using their in-house data analyst, when it comes to maybe um, utilizing maybe some of their marketing team capabilities. There's loads of things that could kind of work in there. And then this article popped up in the New York Times, which kind of was so uh, coincidental with the things that I was thinking about, which says Spotify is doing the same sort of thing. So I'll read it now and I'll get up on the screen. I'll link in the show notes for you guys that are listening via Audible, via the audio experience. Um, so this, this uh, article in New York Times just came out the other day. A new Spotify initiative makes the big record labels nervous. So this article says the following. Um... For decades, the path to stardom in the record industry has usually gone through a major record company. Almost every uh, artist today who reaches the top of the charts, whether Kanye or Adele, Beyonce or Drake, has gotten there with help from one of the three conglomerates that control 8% of the business, which I didn't know that, right? Universal, Sony and Warner Brothers control 8% of the fucking record industry, which is crazy. New Spotify. Now Spotify is experimenting with another approach, one that is making the, the, those labels nervous. Over the, over the last year, the 12-year-old company has quietly struck a li direct licensing deal with a small number of independent artists. The deal gives those artists a way onto the streaming platform and a close relationship to the company, an advantage when pitching music for its influential playlists while bypassing the major record labels altogether. That's amazing, right? Because nowadays, most music discovery, most people's music discovery comes from playlists. Not from me personally, because I still dig. I'm a little bit old school in that regard. Or I still listen to whole albums and shit. But most people are discovering new artists through playlists. Especially um, if you have um, continual play on enabled on your Spotify account, right? So if you listen to a playlist, it'll just continue playing music until the end of time. And it'll kind of like, you know, the algorithm will detect stuff that you like previously or stuff you listened to before and kind of give you stuff that's in the sort of kind of similar sort of vein. So imagine being able to sign license deal with Spotify, get a little bit of money, and also have the advantage of maybe pitching your your music to playlists before anyone else can. Although the deals are modest, the article continues. Although the deals are modest, um, with advanced payments of tens of thousands of tens of tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, according to several people, so not millions, which is still good anyway, regardless. The record companies see um, Spotify initiative as a potential threat. A small step down the line that could reshape the music business as it is existed since the days of um, Victoria. I think this is great to hear because I've always said, right, that I've always kind of thought how annoying it must be if you're an artist who doesn't want to do merch, who doesn't really want to tour that much, maybe wants to do a few live gigs a year. But you have to do all this other stuff on the outside in order to make money because the stream platforms don't make that much money in terms of like, they don't, they make money, but they don't make as much as they should. So if, if you get a thousand plays, you might get only a grand, right? Which doesn't make any sense. So I would always kind of have sympathy for the artist who doesn't want to do merch, just want to do music, but isn't getting enough money from the music. But this is, an, this is great because what it does is that it puts the onus back into the music itself. So if you're an artist who does want to do the whole like tickets, the whole like tickets to my show, um, buy you an album thing and do all that extra stuff and do a festival, sell merch, do a YouTube show or whatever it may be, right? Or do a hosting gig for Showtime or Bravo. That's all well and good. But I think for the guys that guys and girls who just want to concentrate on music, this is fucking amazing. It gives you opportunity to actually do the music, the thing that you're actually put on this earth to do. You can do it and someone can pay you for doing it. And if you want to do a couple of teachers on the side, you can. But for now, you know, for the most part, it's a bit nauseating to see like every single artist has merch. Every single artist is doing a tour. Every single artist um, has some sort of like festival thing that they're trying to promote. 
Do you know what I mean everyone's doing the same thing because they're seeing not they're all not they're all not seeing enough returns from the music itself, so they're having to do these other extra endeavors. So it might be good that now we're kind of finally going to see a return to artists being able to concentrate on music, and in the end, it's going to help um, us, the customer, because we're going to then get music of a much higher caliber because they're not sitting there fucking around with Photoshop files trying to design a T-shirt as well to accompany an album cover. Um, Spotify Stockholm company went public in April has offered a few details about its entry to, into the talent marketplace it has not revealed which artists it has made a deal with and declined to comment on this uh, article according to six people in the industry uh, who have been briefed on recent deals but were not authorized to discuss them publicly Spotify has paid advances to management firms and other companies who represent artists who are not signed to record labels for now this means up and coming artists and all the artists who have gained control over their vintage hits which is great, right? So it's more up and coming and the uh, and the kind of the older end of the of the artists who are kind of gonna um get more from this. But what I like about this too is this um move toward management firms and other companies. I've, I'm sure a lot of people have done that. I remember people looking into that. Is it 300? No, there's a company. There's a mysterious company that's called, sort of like behind Trippy Red and um, and uh, Six Nine. There's, I'm liking the move that these young kids are doing now, where they're getting management to kind of hire. They kind of they kind of get a management team in in place to manage their career instead of going running to record label because that's what happened before right naive kids will go run to record labels in order to kind of like um actualize their dreams they were given a, an advance think that they're rich and then the record label would end up taking massive cuts of their budget because they're spending um all their money on fucking advertising on the radio but now they get management firms who are kind of clocked on kind of clued in into social media who are then going out and hiring freelancers to come and work on an album cover, work on a marketing idea, um, and all sorts of stuff. So they're effectively doing the job of the record company, but they're being a little bit more nimble. They're a little bit more. They're a little bit more quick to the punch. It's sort of like a. Imagine a, if a record label is a corporation. Um, these management firms are sort of like startups. They can quickly. Um, they can quickly put to market quick ideas like from initiate from the idea generation to execution they can quickly do it but if you're a record label it takes a long time to get that machine moving so i'm, I'm see i'm liking how where it's kind of going um an article continues spotify is offering artists two advantages a bigger financial cut and ownership of their recordings which is fucking crucial and it's absolutely nuts to think that artists nowadays don't have ownership of their own music it doesn't make any sense if you make your song and it's yours you own the rights to it but when you sign to record label unfortunately you give up the rights in order for you to get an advance that allows you to make more money now that kind of like um golden handshake was okay a few years ago but now you don't need to in, a, in, a, in an era of streaming where everyone's listening to singles anyway on streaming platforms why you need a record label you need a you don't need a record label anymore because they don't they're going to package your 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 work or your body of work as an album when when you might necessarily you might want it as an album a mixtape but you might also want it to live on different platforms or just on different playlists <coughs> So the, um, and the article continues. So they get a bit of financial cut and ownership of their recordings. The deals, furthermore, are not exclusive, leaving the artists free to license their songs to other streaming companies and um, uh, like Apple Music and Amazon, which is another key ingredient. Some record labels don't allow you to go on radio interviews with some with some stations because they don't have good relationship with them. Imagine how stupid that is, right? A record label won't let you go on a certain radio station because they don't like the presenter or because they've had bad blood with them because of an ex-artist who had nothing to do with you. But with this, you get a bigger financial cut. You get ownership of your recordings, signing a license deal to a streaming platform, and you also you also get the the chance to put your music on different platforms. I'm sure, of course, if Spotify really good to you, there's sort of going to be like an unwritten agreement that you should stick to the people who are kind of like battering your bread and people that have been good to you anyway and not whoring yourself out of there. That should be one example. But for the most part, that kind of ease of mind of knowing that you're not being handcuffed into a situation that you don't necessarily fully understand or you're not necessarily fully sold on, because I'm sure a lot of artists would be like a bit on the fence about the whole thing. This is crucial, absolutely crucial. Um, it continues, Spotify typically pays a record label around 52% of the revenue generated by each stream or play of a given song. So imagine they give 52% to a record label, right? Imagine what record label 52% they give to the artist. Probably like two uh, the label in turn pays the artist a royalty of anywhere 15% um, in, to, in some cases 50% of its cut. By agreeing to direct licensing deal with Spotify, the artist and the representative are able to keep the whole payout, which is fucking insane. The Coast Company has come to make an ambitious public as during an earnings call in July where Daniel Elk, the company's chief executive, um, confirmed reports in Billboard elsewhere that Spotify has pursuing direct deals with independent artists. Um, that's amazing. Um, and he continue, I think he says, licensing content does not make us a label, nor do we have any interest in becoming a label. We don't own rights and any music and we're not acting on the record label. That's amazing. You don't need record labels anyway, man. Fuck record labels. Um, bin them. Burn them all to hell. 
um, license your music to streaming platforms. Uh, get a bigger cut of your earnings. Keep your keep your keep your masters. Keep your recordings. Keep a full ownership of it. Even if you don't make that much money on streams, the fact that you own your music and you're able to do whatever you want with it is the best thing of that you can do with your music overall. So I'm happy to see it um, happening. This article is called "A New Spotify Initiative Makes a New Big Record Labels Nervous." It's a New York Times, but I'll link it on the show notes below. But you can check it out. A new Spotify initiative makes a big record labels nervous. It's up there on New York Times, and it's an incredible, incredible article. Um, what's next on the docket for my listeners? Uh, Elon Musk, Elon Musk, and Joe Rogan. Did you guys watch Elon Musk and Joe Rogan? I'm sure you did. I'm sure you've heard of all the kind of outcries happening on social media with Elon Musk being on um, on Joe Rogan. It was long rumoured that he was going to appear on there. I think a few times it kind of got um, cancelled. I think this was during a time when the Tesla were going through production issue problems and um, Elon was forced to kind of like sleep in the factory and he did that tour with CBS and they kind of did a tour of his uh, boardroom and actually found the kind of duvet and pillow that he sleeps on inside the inside the boardroom in the corner so that was during that time when he had to kind of pull all night as well to make sure the production i think it was the model three was able to go out on time because if not they were at threat of going bankrupt so that was during that time it was cancelled and i think again cancelled again during the whole like um thai cave uh fiasco but he finally made an appearance on Joe Rogan the other day and was an illuminating and an incredible, incredible interview. I've long been a fan of Elon Musk, as I mentioned previously a few times. I've read the incredible um, autobiography of Elon Musk by Ashley Vance. That's available on Audible, actually. Check it out. So if you click my link below on all for audible.com, uh, forward slash A-double-G-G-Y or forward slash Aggie, you can claim one free book credit with a 30-day free trial and you can read uh, Ashley Vance his book uh, on Elon Musk. I think it should be up here on it. Just type in Elon Musk on the search bar. You'll see it's probably the, it's the one way he's kind of like got his arms crossed in the front. It's an amazing autobiography. Details his complete, it's his um, origin story from beginning to the end. Incredibly, incredibly genius kind of creative dude, but also um, suffers a lot from, you know, um, would you say anxiety? I'd say maybe it's anxiety. So I mean, he takes a while to warm up in a Joe Rogan interview. As soon as he has a, a bit of a whiskey, he starts to warm up. As soon as he kind of like understands Joe's kind of comedic timing and all that sort of stuff, they kind of like really bounce up each other really well. And the conversation's illuminating. One of the most interesting parts of the industry in conversation I thought was very, very interesting was the thing he said about um, he's, he's thinking about making... Um, the air conditioning number one right thinking of designing some sort of air conditioning unit that actually works and also you're thinking about con um, designing electric electric airplanes that take off vertically um i think he caveated it and said oh um at the moment the world doesn't need electric airplanes right now what the world needs right now is electric cars and a move to sustainable energy and solar energy and shit so he said it's not like at the top of his priority list but imagine an electric airplane that takes off vertically like that is insane so you kind of limit the amount of space needed in terms of runways and i think he said something along the lines of the tricky part of it is that you need a lot of power to take the plane into orbit but then once it's in kind of orbit you can kind of travel at supersonic speed without that much energy um and it's kind of the trick of kind of figuring that out so that's kind of incredible but just imagine what seeing what that must look like um from orbit or from out out of space kind of similarly that seeing a plane shoot up level out and then fly across like that it must be insane um it's it seems, sounds similar to what he wants to do with the bfr right uh the big fucking rocket there was a kind of like video clip of it where the plane kind of oh, actually let me try and get it up actually see if i can get that bfr video up because that was that was so cool man that was some like super super sci-fi shit but yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Elon Musk, man. I just think there's, you need, in the same vein as a LeBron James or a Cristiano Ronaldo and a Lionel Messi, you need to have these, these people need to exist in society or in the current zeitgeist. And they, they need to be accessible. We need to see them in real life in order for us to appreciate um, genius. We need to see that. We need to see that there is a level of genius out there that exists that is far beyond anything that we can understand, right? There's a guy out there who's kind of like contemplating or uh, philosophizing about the idea of making us multiplanetary species in order to kind of extend our uh, lifespan. But let me see if I check it out here. BFR SpaceX, right? It's absolutely incredible. I remember seeing this video and being like, oh my god, Earth to Earth travel, right? So I'm going to get this up. You guys can see and put this up on the screen. But it's a video about a, a rocket that can that could take people across the world right in under 30 minutes um for the most part 
And I think it's similar to what he's talking about, about the electric um, aeroplane. Um, but with a big fucking rocket, what it would initially be would be like a ferry taking you out to a little port and the rocket will take off and then kind of across and then land back down again. Um, same way um, how the Falcon 9 rockets did the other day or the other couple of months ago when that launch happened. How amazing would that be, right? Hong Kong to Singapore in 24 minutes. Los Angeles, Toronto, 24 minutes. Bangkok, Dubai, 27 minutes. Like an absolutely incredible, incredible idea. Now, I think that's probably the same sort of thing Elon Musk was kind of like talking about when it came to electric airplanes, probably in the same sort of vein. Um, and again, like, like, I, like I mentioned, hearing someone like that speak about electric airplanes that want to go, you know, across the world um, in under a certain time is absolutely insane. But unfortunately, something that's not at the top of his mind at the moment, I'm pretty sure Tesla getting Tesla production up where it needs to be, making sure um, the rockets that he's planning to launch into Mars are going to be working as well. Um, the solar energy stuff, the boring company idea, which is another incredible idea. Uh, the boring company, which is going to create these uh, tunnels underneath LA that are going to allow people to go from point to point. Um, with, especially if you've been to LA, I've been there but once. The traffic is insane there. So allowed to kind of like ease the traffic where you can kind of like go onto these little pods, these little kind of like, trays on the ground on that the ground floor level on a road that will then take you underground into a tunnel and that will then will take you on and then you'll, you'll be on a little like tram skirt thing that then zip you across without you having to drive yourself like amazing amazing idea so it was great again to see elon musk on joe rogan to see them both kind of like sh chop it up everyone kind of was you know in the media was having this kind of fake outrage moment which, which is good actually because i think a lot of people are seeing maybe the whole outrage culture thing is kind of coming to an end because a lot of people were kind of like calling them out on it like you know pretending to be upset that he was smoking on joe rogan like come on guys he's on joe rogan what do you expect is going to happen man that's what you do when you go to joe rogan podcast you smoke uh you talk about monk you talk about apes and whatever um you talk about brazilian jiu-jitsu you talk about um the benefits of training and how it relieves stress you talk about how shitty nine to five jobs are right like, this is what it is like this is joe rogan so that fake outrage of him smoking a joint which he didn't even smoke right it kind of reminded me the first time i had a i had a joint i remember i told this guy once i remember him kind of giving me a dirty look of kind of being a bit disgusting i said oh we doesn't really do anything for me because i hadn't smoked it i did what elon musk did you know when you have your first cigarette and you kind of go Phew. do you know what i mean it's like you the smoke goes in your mouth but it doesn't really do anything so um I remember that happening. I think some people, I remember PewDiePie actually said the other day that he felt as if like Joe Rogan kind of bullied Joe, uh, uh, Elon Musk into smoking a joint by like saying in the beginning, oh, you can't do this, of course, right? I think that's what Joe Rogan says. Like, you, you can't do this. Isn't it? You're not allowed really, are you? You're not allowed to do this. Sort of like um, um, kind of goaded him into it. And he was like, oh, okay, I'll do it. Do you know what I mean? Because um, it did feel sometimes as if there was a, there was a kind of feeling, so especially towards the middle of the interview, you kind of get the idea that Elon wanted Joe and Jamie to like him. Like, which is quite interesting to see, like that kind of dynamic work. He kind of wanted to be liked in the room, um, which was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, overall, an incredible interview, um, very illuminating, uh, very thought provoking. And again, just a, a real pleasure to be allowed the opportunity to hear this guy speak for three hours uninterrupted without any agenda about things that he's actually interested in, things he's working on. Um, 
and you just kind of got an idea, a kind of impression of what it must be to be a super genius, you know, the kind of suffering you have to go through where you're a super genius in one aspect, but in another aspect, you're maybe a little bit at fault with the way he kind of has kind of like, you know, interacted on social media and the way he's kind of going about things hasn't been that great. There is kind of like some errors in your ways as well that you kind of need to iron out, but you know, you can't, you're not perfect in that regard, but it must be, again, it must be a, what a burden to have that kind of level of intention. I, me- I remember he actually did mention in an interview that, you know, he think he, when he was really young, like five or 10 years old, he kind of thought he was going to get sent off to an insane asylum because he had so much shit in his head, like so many ideas, so many thoughts running through his head constantly. And then that's when he realized he wasn't normal because then no one else had that, right? It's like, you know, when you're like, because I'm super observant. I think I'm observant than most people. Like, I like to look up. I like to look around. Sometimes I'll be walking around, talking to the brunette, talking to the friends. Oh, do you see that? Do you see that? Oh, do you see that person who this? And it's like, no, I didn't see it. Some people just walk around willfully blind or just don't give a shit. Whereas I do. Or I'm constantly thinking about things. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not even, I'm like an ant compared to Elon Musk, right? I'm nothing. But I, I always think, imagine what it must be like being actually intelligent because i'm curious right i'm not like super intelligent i'm just a curious person imagine what it must be like when you're super intelligent and you actually have solutions and they're all wrangling in your head you're kind of like troubleshooting ideas in your head constantly it must be super super uh, fatiguing but it was great to see elon Musk talk it was great to kind of get his idea and everything and yeah i can't wait to see what this crazy motherfucker does next man i just love how he has so much fun with his stuff as well you know uh making his cars dance like secret features in there that haven't been unlocked yet like just i love i love how he just goes about things he's a cool interesting dude man i love him very 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 much anyway um what's next on the docket what the else i have here i've got to move this around here actually oh eminem album review um album review Everyone's kind of talking about Eminem. Do I, do, I have, do I have an album review or do I have an, what I want to say about it? Okay, Eminem album review. Album M- Eminem released Kamikaze the other day, right? And everyone's kind of going up in arms about it. And everyone's got an opinion about Eminem because I guess over the last few years, he's kind of flattered to deceive because he came out, you know, the first four albums that Eminem released were, you know, qu- quite, you know, they were like, it's arguable to be saying maybe they were up there with some of the greatest hip hop albums that ever came out, yeah, right? Um, he was probably like four for four by the time he just first came out, right? So kind of on that kind of Kendrick level, like every album he was putting in the beginning was really good. Then he reached a point where he got really popular and became like a mega, mega, mega star, kind of crossed over, and his albums started to be get started to get progressively worse and worse. A lot more poppy tunes, a lot more mainstream tunes, but for the most part, some rap fans pop with it because he was able to to sprinkle in or a couple of like hood tracks here and there. But it didn't it didn't happen the last few years. And then um, Revival came out the other, the other uh, last year and it was very, very underwhelming. Um, super, so, so much so that some of the tracks sounded a lot like each other. He had Pink on the album in 2008, 17, which is like, what? So a lot of people were really underwhelmed by the album and he got a lot of negative backlash towards it. And then, he, of course, um, it seems as if M- M- Eminem isn't very social media savvy or isn't very plugged into the culture. But um, guessing by the lyrics of Kamikaze, we were all wrong because he was paying attention to everything everyone said. And he basically made an album dedicated to kind of like shitting on his haters and also reaffirming that he's actually good at rapping, which no one had doubted, but he wasn't able to make music that was um, resonating or connecting with people now. But he was able to demonstrate that he was good at rapping, which is two different things. But this album is really good, Kamikaze. I think it's probably the best thing he's done in a long, long time. The track he's got with Jonah Lucas, the track towards the end with Jesse Rodriguez are fucking insane. Like, he's actually good at rapping. And ironically enough, even though he's shitting on all the young guys coming up, right, the the album, the track he's got with Royce the Five Nine, where he does um, Look Alive, sort of like remix, very re-edit, is really good. He does that style really good. If he's able to, like, dumb himself down in quote-unquote, he'd be actually quite killer nowadays, but he can't do it. He's got too much integrity. But I was a little bit put off by the idea of coming out with an album, shitting on all the current artists who are currently doing what they're doing and having their limelight, but also demonstrating no ability to actually... Um, plug in or sound like anything that's happening now that doesn't make any sense right because music evolves and i think hip-hop is weird in that respect where it doesn't seem as if apart from jay-z and apart from maybe a tribe called quest and um oh who else there's a few others um there doesn't seem to be a few doesn't doesn't mean to me doesn't mean to there doesn't appear to be a lot of older statesmen rappers uh, male or female who are happy to just be older statesmen they all want to be uh regarded within the same conversation as amigos or a drake 
And that's why I think the mistake is. I think if you're an Eminem and you feel as if you're not getting respect you deserve, I think that's okay because it means that the generations have moved on. Some people don't even know who you are. Some people were born um, within the last few, within the beginning of the 2000s, right? So their reference points aren't as deep as other people, right? Or they just don't know. They, they only know what they know now, right? So it's okay if they don't know you because that means life has moved on. But it's also okay to cater to the fans who are always going to be with you. There's always going to be a group of people who are always going to listen to Eminem. And I think chasing the new fans or trying to educate them on what's good and, let, and telling them what they, what they love and cherish is shit isn't a good way to earn, earn fans. Because I'm sure little Yachty fans that heard him this little Yachty or this little pump aren't going to not listen to their artists going to listen to Eminem. They're just going to say fuck Eminem and, and, and play little pump all day. So that was a bit that didn't really make any sense to me. And I guess overall, as an industry, hip-hop doesn't necessarily seem like it's capable of um, putting itself as being the old person in the room, right? Like, for instance, that radio personality, Ebro and Hilton Seven is a good example. Instead of judging that young people by young people's standards, it's always held up upon what an old person does, right? And I don't think you can equate the same sort of thing. They need to be able to exist within their own silo. Whether or not it's destructive, whether or not it's, it's beneficial, it's encouraging for the youth or not, it doesn't matter. They should be allowed to exist as they are right and be able to uh, create their own future their own little timeline and then and then if you want to be competitive to the to the past after they've gone then yes but in current times you can't be equating the both it doesn't make any sort of sense but again that's why i think L L eminem kind of lets himself down he's so desperate for a uh, recognition and acknowledgement and respect from the current generation that he's missing the mark with the people that actually like him because the album itself is quite good it's probably the best thing he's done but i think as people mentioned uh, before it's good it's not amazing, it's not incredible, but it's good. But this should be the bar of Eminem. He should be always producing albums at this level. You shouldn't be putting out a revival. Revival is absolute dog piss. Like, you should not be putting out a revival. Eminem is too good of an artist. Even And everybody has said, oh, he does too many rapid raps and he can't make songs. I disagree. I think he can make songs. I think he's proved that on this album. He can make good songs. But he just needs to do it to this level of standards as Kamikaze. It can't be any lower to than this. So... I'm a, I'm a fan of it. I don't prescribe to the I know he's not um, kind of like in vogue now to like Eminem because he dissed everybody and there's kind of like current Joe Budden beef that's happening that's really funny to kind of see from the outside because I think they've got a lot of personal issues going on there. But for the most part, I think the album's pretty decent. I've played it once or twice. It's not something I'm going to be playing out loud um, at, um, a lot or it's not much, got much replay value for me. It's not something I'm going to be incorporating into a DJ set or anything. I don't think so for the most part. But overall, it's a decent album. I quite I quite liked it. I quite enjoyed it. I'm not I'm, I'm not going to say anything worse than that, really. I thought it was quite a decent album. And I think he did a pretty good job of maybe certifying himself. And like I said, he, he gave John Lucas an amazing look. John Lucas is going to have... Whoever album he puts out next, everyone's going to be definitely looking for it. Because that feature... He absolutely smashed it. John Lucas absolutely smashed that feature on the album as well. So yeah, I was a big fan of it. I didn't really mind it. I don't saw. I didn't see what really the hoopla was about. Everyone's kind of getting their knickers and twisted by it. But I thought the album was pretty decent for me, for me, for me. And talking about more music um, acknowledgement, did you hear Drake and uh, Meek Mill finally made up? Man, that's fucking amazing. I'm absolutely stoked on it. Um, I'm sure everyone knows of that the whole timeline with Drake and McMill, but this was a, a a battle or a beef that was very real that was gone that could could have potentially gone to a very dark place. But fortunately or unfortunately, during that whole time of mess that was happening, McMill was kind of like in and out of prison or in and out of jail because of um, his breaking of his probation and that kind of probation officer who had kind of like a real big hard on for him. So that kind of just, um, put a pause on a lot of the drama that we we're going to see but I, I, do, I, I think it goes without saying that if they were if, if Meek Mill was free and was able to move around as much as he wanted to move around I think this beef could have gone south very very quickly because um, again you have to you have to realise right in hip hop it's very as soon as you throw out that kind of like ghost writing thing for someone you're doing it in the hopes that you'll end their career right and that's what kind of Meek Mill did they had kind of had this weird beef where supposedly um, for one of Meek Mill's songs, I think he got a verse that was written for him by Drake. Got a, sent a verse to Meek Mill that was already written for him. Meek Mill felt away by it, but didn't say anything. Then when Drake didn't post about the album, he got really pissed off and then kind of like lashed out on Twitter and told everybody, "Hey, Drake doesn't even write his own raps." And then everyone was like, "Whoa, oh my god!" Everyone was so shocked about all that shit in it, and it kind of unfolded and went to a big story. And then when we got charged up, that's when we got all those kind of tunes came out. You know what I mean? It was a big, big, big deal at the time and everyone kind of thought Drake's career is going to be over but you know as as is obvious with the new generation or within people music nowadays I think people have got a better standing on music or people are willfully blind and just didn't give a shit as long as Drake was able to serve up his his songs you serve up hits no one really cares if he writes his own tracks or, 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 or if he doesn't but in Meek Mill's um, 
case. He did put that out there in order to kind of end Drake's career. That it wasn't malicious intent involved in it. And if you're someone like Drake and you have built an entire empire or based on your musical talents and you're feeding a lot of your friends and you gave a lot of your friends uh, jobs for life and a lot of your friends are supporting their families on the back of the music that you're doing, you're going to take it incredibly personal when someone uh, tries to, quote unquote, take uh, food off your plate. So it was a very, very, very serious, serious beef. And um, it was something that I didn't think would be reconciled personally. I just thought maybe there was too much, um, too many darts thrown, too many bullets um, were aimed at each other that there was no way that they could kind of come come to kind of uh, reconcile the situation. But I'm glad, especially nowadays where real beef does exist and people are dying over the things that they say in public. I'm glad to see two big names within the hip hop industry still able to kind of reconcile because even though Meek Mill did what he did and kind of everyone kind of sided with Drake in that regards, he did sell quite a lot of albums, right? He's, he's one of those artists that weirdly enough has a very big fan base, much larger than you'd expect it to be, right? He always sells, I don't know, 150,000 units first week and sales don't matter, but if you want indications how popular somebody is, even without the big machine behind him, selling hundred. 50,000 albums first week um and plus is a really good indication so um drake posted this picture on his instagram the other day and kind of like confirming that they'd kind of made up and squashed the beef which is very interesting considering i think kanye is loitering around somewhere trying to squash the beef with drake too and the caption reads um this really gave me a uh, peace of mind tonight healing and moving forward created one of the most electric and gratifying moments of my career meek me i'm happy that you are home and that we could find our way back to our joint purpose cue to kevin garner anything's possible would ad lib amazing man good good to see both of these guys kind of reconcile and come back together and um I don't care about new music really maybe it gives actually i do care about new music because if we're going to get new aston martin music with drake and rick ross because you know they will kind of not work drake and uh, rick ross is the best kind of artist assigned to ever isn't he R drake and drake and rick ross didn't make any songs during the whole period of this uh, meat mill beef nothing rick ross stayed completely loyal to his friend didn't throw drake under the bus was very diplomatic and what he says in public but i would love some aston martin music um between from, from um drake and rick ross again now that they've made up that would be so so good so I don't really care about music between Drake and McMill anymore. I just want them to be, I just want peace in the Middle East. And maybe this is something that can be copied now within the industry overall, you know, squashing beef, moving on and just look, man, there's too much money to be made out there. All these streaming platforms are eager to sign up at, um, acts and get the music out there. People are eager to kind of play that shit before they go out and in festivals and stuff. There's no time to be beefing and ending people's lives over um, weird sort of beef that no one really cares about as well for the most part. And we just want to hear the hits, man. Hit records. That's what we want to hear. Uh, la, 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 la. What else here? Ooh, honey, X or Y residency. This is one might 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 be a nice place to end it. Honey, 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 DJ Honey, one of my favorite DJs. Someone I've been a big fan of. Someone who I saw. Where did I see him? Robert Johnson. I don't know where I saw Honey. Where did I see Honey? I seen someone. I forgot the name of it. Anyway, um, well, Honey, um, one of my favorite DJs is now taking over from residency at X or Y. I can't. I'm I'm looking forward to the day that I do a residency at X or Y. I really love XY. I went to see um, MCD, mostly drum ensemble during his residency. No, during his residency, residency, the residency at XOYO uh, alongside Young Marco. That was absolutely amazing. And I saw Jeremy Underground there too once. XOYO is a brilliant venue in Shoreditch in East London. Really, really nice. It's a lot better than what you expect it to be um, for a big club. Drinks are probably a bit overpriced, but you know, that's what you get in most nightclubs. But two rooms, uh, fairly well spaced out, great sound system, secure. Uh, a lot of security don't get me wrong but fairly nice and laid back security and just a generally good vibe i'm a big fan of x a while so now um that uh, most drop assembles ended his residency honey takes over for october and he's going to be bringing loads of guests but opening night is happening on i think is it 12th of october get up on the screen screen here so i'm resident advisor i think so i'm in the 12th so honey djing x to y residency on the 12th so that should be fucking insane i can't wait to check that out october 12th b there b squared a postcard from honey um, what's that actual postcard saying let me read this there's a little postcard that he actually made too that's quite cool um i'm delighted to play i'm delighted to play um each Friday from October until December, X or Y with friends from all over the Brilliant Corners family will transform and host the second room for the whole time of the residency. It will be fun. Very soon we'll be we will dance together Friday after Friday. Can't wait. Yours truly, honey. So amazing, man. I can't wait to for this residency to happen. Um 
I'm glad of all these new um, residencies that are happening in some of these bigger clubs. They're deciding to, instead of just like booking random acts throughout the month that, you know, fluctuate in terms of takings, it's better just to kind of stick with one common theme as a lead kind of residency artist and then invite them to kind of like bring guests and stuff in. Um, I would love to have a residency actually. My residencies are super cool. I, I kind of have that now with the bars I, I DJ in Leighton Stone and stuff where you can kind of play every single month. But to have a residency in a big club where you're able to kind of like play in front of a lot of people, you're able to kind of like maybe, I don't know, um, grow a little bit quicker. That might be amazing, especially playing every single Friday at a big club. It must be super, super sick. But it's, that's something to aim for in the long term. I can't wait for that to be me very, 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 very soon. Very, 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 very soon. I'm thinking about entering that NTS thing, that um, artist development program. I don't know if I should do it or not. Maybe I should. Hmm. I'm debating of it anyway. I'm uh, I'm not sure if I should do it, if I can't do it, if I am going to do it. But I really want to do the artist development thing, NTS, to see if I can kind of circumvent my way in there. I promised myself I wouldn't ask again, because I remember I asked once, and the guy was being a bit iffy. I was like, you know what? you got some shit people on that fucking station, to be honest, you know? But... Anyway, let me see. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking. Maybe I should enter it and just kind of see what happens. Um, it'd be funny if I do get in somewhere, shape or form, or get to some second stage. I'll be stuck. But yeah, um, that's it, actually. Excellent Zinger Show, episode number what? 104 with me, Agostino. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to sign out now and head off to the working man. Working man life. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Audible. It's came one free book credit. So it's a 30-day free trial. Click the link below at audible.com for just Aggie. That's audible.com for just A-W-G-G-Y. And I'll take you to the link and you can do all that other stuff, Malaki. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Tomorrow for another episode of the Aggie Zinger Show.